Good evening, and welcome to this debate for the primary election of the Democratic Party. This evening's debate is for both the East Hampton Town Supervisor and the East Hampton Town Council. For spots on the Democratic Party ticket in the general election on November 6. The date of the primary election is June 22nd, with early voting beginning on June 12th. The League of Women Voters is a trusted, nonpartisan, national political organization. While we never endorse any candidate or any parties, we are directly involved in communicating to our communities about issues that are important to them. We are respected for the work we do, particularly in holding debates like this and in providing information on elections and election issues. I'm Judy Roth of the League of Women Voters of the Hamptons, Shelter Island, and the North Fork, and I will be your moderator for the evening. Gloria Ann Burke, will be the timer. Um, and now, please join me for our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance uh, to the United States of America, America and to the, to the Republic which it stands, which it stands one nation, one nation, nation under God, God, individual, liberty, and justice, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, Alexis, will you take yourself off the screen? Okay, sorry. Uh, the first debate will be between the candidates for town supervisor. They are uh, Peter Van Skoyek and Jeff Bragman. The format of the debate is as follows. Each candidate will have a two minute opening statement then each candidate will have two minutes to answer each of the questions. Um, each candidate will then have a one minute rebuttal after both of them have spoken. And there is an unlimited number of rebuttals that supervisor candidates can have. Um, and after each person has answered the question, um, they, they need to please raise their hands and let me know if they want a rebuttal. And then each candidate will have a one minute closing statement. And we're going to begin alphabetically with Mr. Bradman. And you can begin now. You have two minutes to do your opening statement. Thank you. Uh, good evening and thank you for hosting this discussion. Uh, I've lived in East Hampton for more than 35 years and raised my son here while practicing land use law, environmental law. And I've advised pretty much all the boards that handle zoning and planning and work under several town supervisors under uh, times of very intense development pressures. I was instrumental in creating a Shadmore State Park and the transfer of ownership of the Boys and Girls Harbor to the town. And I, I even negotiated for the town uh, over Amagansett Square. Over the years, um, I've learned to listen and respect residents' local knowledge. To me, East Hampton is not a brand name, it's not a reality TV show, and it's never been the Hamptons. It's a real town with real needs. And I ran for office for a simple reason. East Hampton is my home, and I want to protect it. Um, as a councilman, I have a, a strong record of results, protecting Wainscott residents from water contamination and keeping them sa safe even while they were waiting for public water to be installed, stopping dust storms in Amagansett, bringing farmers and residents together because everybody loses when our fields erode, strengthening our zoning to protect view sheds uh, and, and preserve the lands we spent millions to buy. And I even found the law for the seaplane ban that we've recently enacted. There is work left to do. I'd like to help the Camp Hero residents in Montauk who need a state-of-the-art septic system and can't afford it after years of repairs of their faulty, uh, in their faulty uh, wastewater uh, uh, management district. No one gets everything they want. And I couldn't persuade the town board to contribute $50,000 at the height of COVID to our food pantries. And a couple of weeks later, I said no to, the, to a payment that they made 
uh, of $60,000 to a New York City public relations firm. I've been insistent that renewable energy be environmentally sound, and I'd like our board to be a little bolder in joining with other towns to purchase renewable energy. I criticized the one-sided Duryea deal, and we never reviewed it or voted on it, and it came out of a secret meeting, and I reject secret meetings and backroom deals, period. I believe in leading by listening, and I don't claim to have all the answers. I'll never be a my way or the highway supervisor. My only hope Okay. is that this discussion will let you see that you can trust me with your okay. vote. Okay, please stop. Okay, uh, Peter? Good evening. I am East Hampton Town Supervisor Peter Van Skoik, and I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for providing the community this opportunity to hear directly from the candidates in the Democratic primary. I've served East Hampton for more than two decades, 11 years on our planning and zoning boards, 10 years on the town board. And I'm now seeking my third term as supervisor, Throughout my many years of service, I've always been serving our environment, water quality, and building our community's strength and resilience at the forefront of my efforts. I've worked to preserve hundreds of acres of open space, protect beach access, preserve historic structures. But what I find has been most rewarding and challenging has been safely guiding our community through the greatest worldwide pandemic in over a century. I'm proud of my administration's efforts we kept the COVID infection rate the second lowest on Long Island. We provided testing sites. We worked with our business leaders and town staff to ensure that the needs of our community were being met. We directed tens of thousands of dollars to our food pantries. We delivered over 67,000 prepared meals to senior citizens during the pandemic. We hired a public relations firm to ensure that the latest guidance and information was available to the public. I understood that bringing vaccine access directly to our community when none was available would require that the town would need to set up its own mass vaccination center. We put out the call to community volunteers and had overwhelming response. To date, we have vaccinated thousands of East Hampton residents and we're the only community in Suffolk County to accomplish this feat. Our local vaccination rate is over 70%. We didn't just address the pandemic, we continue to safely operate town government maintain our town finances, move, it, move forward to meet our 100% renewable energy goals, and work with the trustees to negotiate a $29 million host community benefit package on behalf of the people of East Hampton. Executing these agreements paved the way to bring clean, renewable wind energy to over 70,000 South Fork homes. It's been an incredible honor to have been elected and serve this community that I love. Whether it's potholes or pandemics, I stand ready to continue my service to the people of East Hampton, and I ask you for, su for your support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, the first question will go to uh, Peter Van Skoya, and it's about the airport. Um, at the May 11th public meeting, four options for the airport were presented. They are close the airport, close it temporarily to get around the FAA and reopen it again with strict regulations, keep the airport as it is, or keep it open, but negotiate with the FAA to limit uh, noise and access. What criteria will you use by making this important decision on the future of the airport? And would you seek input from Southampton and Shelter Island? So the criteria, the criteria that, the, I'm sorry, we have a really bad echo. Can you hear me? Yes. That's better. Okay. okay. Thank you. I, the criteria that, um, you know, I would use is the same one that we've used to date to have a very methodical and fact-based analysis of what benefits the airport brings and what detriments. And I think that, you know, this is always a balancing test within the community, but we have to be able to rely on really good data. So we've commissioned a number of studies. Most recently, we revealed the results of our economic study. Uh, it's important to understand what the benefit is economically. It seems to be much, much smaller than what's been purported for many years. And I think dispelling myths about what the airport is and what it brings is important. We understood earlier on that people were saying that we couldn't operate the airport without FAA funds. We've dispelled that myth. There's over $7 million of surplus in the airport fund. But active engagement with the community in a, in a 
fair and uh, honest review uh, of what the airport is and brings and what the community really wants is really important. We've always kept our, um, our emails and phone lines and welcomed people from all over the region to comment on the airport. It is a regional impact that it has. So whether you live on the North Fork or Southampton, our joining communities are impacted by the traffic from our airport and we are considering that. Jeff? Yeah, I'm happy to get this question. I, I'm, uh, I have a, an extensive record actually as an attorney before I got elected in opposing uh, uh, airport noise and trying to limit it by limiting traffic. And it was a very frustrating period of time uh, because the law is uh, very limited as to what you can do when you're under FAA control. Uh, I'm now actually managing uh, as the airport liaison, the process to re revision the airport. And there is sort of a continuum. I think e pretty much everyone recognizes and understands that the status quo is not, is not going to work. And speaking of communities other than East Hampton, we, we get calls and letters and heartache from people all over the East End and really even as far away as Queens. And some of them are very tell very dramatic stories about how airport noise, aircraft noise is really ruining their, the tranquility of their lives. So I have said early and clearly that we have a moral obligation uh, to take those complaints into account. It's not only uh, the effect, the impacts of noise on East Hampton residents. It involves uh, impacts that go far away, Noyak, Queens, uh, the North Shore Orient Point. So it's a continuum of what we could do. On one hand, it, it used to be uh, virtually unthinkable that we would close the airport. But today, given the ever increasing rise in noise, it's become a legitimate option. There are also gradations of airports that we could have between the two alternatives of keeping it as it is and closing it. We could create a smaller airport. We could create a, an airport for small recreational pilots. Frankly, I'd like to see an end to seaplanes, jets, and helicopters. Um, I, I think they are an intrusion. When I kayak on Northwest uh, Creek and I hear a big jet coming over, it's, uh, it feels more like uh, Queens and Kennedy Airport than East Hampton. I want the tranquility and the silence of East Hampton are very important to me. And that's kind of my mainstay in analyzing what to do. I lived with an airport for small planes for many years and could probably live with that again. Okay, thank you. Um Peter, Could you I, have a rebuttal? Mm -hmm. I have just an additional comment. And I, and I think it's important. I think the distinction here is, is that uh, while I may agree with Jeff on many points, I don't think it's up to what a council person or a supervisor thinks should happen. I think it's really important to engage the community and primarily the residents of East Hampton. That's who elects us and hear from them directly uh, inform us as to where, where they want the uh, you know, things to go. So, you know, I think having that open dialogue and exchange is extremely important and I stand by ready to listen. I'd just like to offer a comment and say, of course, of course, it all comes down uh, to listening to the public. That's why uh, we've designed the process that we have. Um, we're starting a little late on it, but it, it, essentially we want to, uh, as I said, lead by listening. I want to hear what uh, residents think, and I, I haven't made my mind up, frankly. Um, I'd like to hear what people think, and there are many creative ideas out there. People are talking about solar. They're talking about uh, passive recreation. Uh, there's been some talk of shortening our runways and limiting the traffic to less noisy aircraft. So everything's on the table, and uh, you know, it, it will be a combination of leading and also listening to the public. Okay, thank you. Um, the second question, um, which Jeff will start, concerns um, both Wainscott and, and the um, South Fork Wind Farm. Um, and so um, what is your position on, on the South Fork wind, uh, wind Farm and its uh, cable landing on, um, on Wainscott's Beach Lane? And along with that, do you feel that that this issue is what has triggered uh, Wayne Scott's position trying to become an independent village? They, they definitely are related. Um, I, uh, I uh, support the use of wind power as one of the solutions we have to solve this existential crisis of global warming. Um, at the same time, 
I am a strong advocate for environmental re review. And I, I think it's important to keep in mind that whether we love a project or hate a project or are indifferent to it, every project we deal with has to pass through that kind of a process of environmental review. And actually, the wind farm hasn't finished its environmental review. Uh, even as of today, there's an extreme controversy over how and whether uh, turbines can be sited near this unbelievably fertile uh, uh, habitat known as uh, Cox's Landing. Um, I, and I will say, I, I was not enthusiastic about uh, tearing up Beach Lane. Uh, there, are, there are other ways to access wind power uh, through something called community choice aggregation, where we buy a renewable energy together with our, our, our neighbors. But I, I, do, I, know, I know the importance of wind power. I support it. And I might add that when I spoke up and said we should have environmental review, that's why we didn't accept the first offer that the supervisor was urging me to accept for $8 million. And we didn't, we got $29 million because we were looking at environmental review. It always, it always helps us uh, get a, a better uh, program. And I do think that uh, this project uh, is, is behind the, uh, uh, the uh, urge to uh, incorporate Wayne Scott. And maybe I'll have to talk about that a little bit more in rebuttal because the supervisor's involved in that issue. Peter? Well, you know, 100% renewable energy goal was um, made by the town board back in 2014. And offshore wind is the best way to meet that renewable energy goal. There simply isn't enough space for solar on land. And with regard to Wayne Scott and the fact that, you know, Wayne Scott, some in Wayne Scott are looking to incorporate is I think the lack of leadership that the Wayne Scott liaison brought for the three years during the period we were negotiating. And it's a misstatement for Mr. Bragman to say that I was ready to accept $8 million. We hadn't even been negotiating at that point. We were doing our due diligence to listen to the people of Wayne Scott and take into consideration every single environmental question that came up, whether it was the possibility of EMF radiation, uh, is, was that a threat? Were there wetlands involved? Was there water contamination that would be you know, further exacerbated by the cable route uh, excavations? So we were very methodical. The settlement agreements and talks through the PSC process were extensive. They included every single involved state agency, over 71 different private entities and persons, stakeholders, and it was an exhaustive environmental review much more stringent than any secret review the town would have done. So, you know, we always negotiated with the, the standpoint that we needed to keep moving forward. We needed to analyze and review any uh, concerns and mitigate them. And, you know, I think it's really important to understand that we also conditioned all of our agreements upon successful completion of all environmental re review and sign off by all government agencies. The Public Service Commission for New York State and the BOEM, um, you know, uh, Federal Bureau of Energy Management Review, which is still underway, as Councilman Bragman uh, wrote. But you know, it's it's uh, it's Cox's ledge, Jeff, and it's it is an important fishing area. Uh, Thirty-five years ago, I fished that commercially. Uh, I'm well aware of what that area is, and while it does have incredible, uh, you know, imp um, resources there, uh, there is a process to avoid those resources, which is ongoing. And, you know, it was just okay. recently announced that the turbines will reduce from 15. Okay. To Could you? Okay. I'm going to cut you off. But can, let's, I, can, let's... I have a little, can I have a rebuttal to that? Yes, you can have a rebuttal. Okay. Yes. One minute. As, as liaison to Wayne Scott, I did something that kind of annoyed the town board. I listened to Wayne Scott. And if you ask whether, you know, the, the, the wind farm is part of the, uh, the impetus for them considering uh, incorporating, it's true. And the reason it's true is because my opponent went to Wayne Scott, to the CAC, looked him in the eye and said, I'm not going to give away that easement until they conclude environmental review. And it wasn't true. 
And as soon as he was elected, he said, well, we've had a referendum on wind power, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. That's what made Wayne Scott angry. It wasn't a lack of initiative on the liaison. He's talking about me when he says that. It was the fact that he looked him in the eye, said one thing and did another thing. And that is when people don't think that they can rely on your word. Yes, that undermines their confidence in your ability to regulate them. And he did come to my office, all six foot four of them, towering over my desk when I was a brand new councilman and said, we got to give this away. They're going to give us $8 million. Well, because, because okay. I slowed them down to take a look at the environment, it turned into $29 million. And the environmental review is not done yet. Okay. I'm going to caution you both that we want to stick to the time, but go ahead with your one I believe I, I believe I'm entitled to rebuttal. Yes, you are. Uh, in terms of you know, trusting what people say, uh, Mr. Bragman can't be trusted. It's well reported in the paper that when I addressed the Wayne Scott CAC, I stated that the town board would probably not sign prior to environmental review. And in fact, the way these easements are structured, there is no uh, grant of any rights until that review is completed successfully and that both agencies have signed off with certificates. So again, you know, it's it's all about trying to mislead the public as to what really occurred, and what was really said. Well, I don't know if I... Uh, no more. Okay. Um, the next question um, is for Peter. Um, sticking with the environment, um, what is your... Uh, commitment to solar energy, and what is the status of the two-acre solar farm on Akabanak Road in Springs? Well, I do have a very, very large and important commitment to uh, solar energy. Uh, I initiated the town's solar solarized East Hampton program back in 2018. And I also, as you said, uh, moved the project forward for the largest first megawatt scale solar farm on the entire South Fork. 1.1 megawatts of energy, basically providing all of the town municipal governments uh, half of that usage. Um, my goal is that we complete that. We have a battery storage, the first battery storage solar program uh, for a municipality that's being completed on town hall property that I initiated. That will be completed, uh, that work begins in July of this year. Uh, but it's it's not enough just to talk about, you know, protecting the environment or the solar initiatives. I felt it's always been important to lead by example. So I installed solar on my property three years ago and it produced a, a, an average of 117 percent of all the electricity that I use in my residence. And it's cost me very little money. I'm saving about one hundred dollars a month on my total expenses in, in addition to that. So. While you can talk about, um, you know, it's important to move forward in, in uh, uh, you know, solar energy or, or any other renewable energy, I think uh, my actions speak clearly that I support it and that I lead by example. Jeff? This, uh, this, this raises an issue that, uh, you know, is, is close to my heart, and that is that there is a, a form of a consortium that we can organize where we join with uh, nearby municipalities that are bigger than us. And we can combine our, uh, our energy needs into a larger market and we can shop for renewable energy. It's called community choice aggregation. It's kind of a mouthful there, but it, it's a free market way that we can enter the renewable markets very quickly. And we've dawdled on this. We are th we're three years behind where the town of Southampton is. It took us three years to enact uh, a law that uh, enables us to, to, to form a CCC a consortium. We just did it this late this past year. And as I said, we're three years behind the town of Southampton. And what I'd like to see, and it makes a, a world of difference in the use of solar because it's going to authorize us to do something they call community distributed generation. We get a much better rate on solar. We can direct benefits to portions of our population that need help with their electric bills. And, it, and it's community developed energy. And it's something that we should be jumping into immediately. We can, uh, we can access very deep knowledge that we don't have in the town of East Hampton because 
the administrator for the town of Southampton was hired by a competitive bid. So we, we can hire that same company. We don't have to competitive, competitively bid. We can bring them on and we can immediately have a source of deep knowledge about how we can get in on the community distributed generation that has now become much, much more uh, profitable for the town. It's a little different than the solar array that we have. So solar is moving in a very good direction and it's going to be very capable very soon. Peter, you have a rebuttal? Yeah, it's not CCC, it's CCA, and we're not behind Southampton by three years. In fact, there's no municipality on Long Island that presently is moving forward with our procurement through CCA. And the reason is because there are amendments to the LIPA tariff structure of Long Island that are needed. In fact, Fred Thiel just uh, put out an announcement that his bill to help aid and that change has just passed the assembly and it's currently being debated in the state Senate. Senator Palumbo is bringing that legislation forward in the Senate. And, um, you know, I think, again, not knowing uh, what the truth is about CCA and where, where we are with any of our town programs uh, just demonstrates the difference in leadership here. I think, you know, uh, Southampton is in the same position that we are. Um, and there, I, in fact, sent a letter to the PSC on Southampton's behalf to uh, encourage the PSC to clarify better uh, the previous rule. And uh, again, Fred Thiel is working hard to get the, those other obstacles. Um, so, you know, okay. we're not behind. In fact, we lead okay. we're the first with a mega full okay. wide scale solar. So you've used up your time. We, we, we are we are we are behind and I, I know all about the letter and you misdescribed what the letter was the, 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 they're considering now whether or not we we have to enter the retail renewable market before we can have a cdg project and that's going to be and and you did write a letter but we're actually i don't not sure you know but a couple of days afterwards lipa pisa wrote a letter against the town of southampton's position they are much farther ahead than we are they they have hired an administrator who is running a CCA program, and we're not we're not even nearly there. And what I'm saying is that by joining them and creating this kind of consortium, we can get the benefit of their expertise. We should have done it two years ago. We dawdled around on it. I've you know I've been talking about it for a long time. I'm glad we're going to catch up. And the, the tariffs are much better be, uh, for this community distributed generation because they come from NYSERDA, the New York State Research Energy and Development Authority, not through LIPA PSAG. So it's okay. organized differently. There's a okay. lot of possibilities with it. Okay, thanks a lot. All right, to a different topic, um, one that is near and dear to many people and that is cell service, um, which continues to be a problem uh, with springs for parts of the Northwest. And cell service has really become a safety issue for everyone. Um, how will you address this problem and bring better cell service to all of us who need it? And this question is directed to um, to Jeff to start. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm only I'm only I'm smiling not because I'm I'm denigrating the problem. It's a real it's a real problem. I'm smiling because the very first question I was asked when I ran for town board in 2017 was, "What's going on with cell service?" And we're finally we're finally moving forward in a in a more organized way. Just recently, like as of November, we hired a firm that's going to develop uh, coverage maps and help us understand you know, where we have uh, coverage weaknesses. We know Springs is, is terrible. It was never included in the plans. I, I, don't, I don't know why. You know, we don't provide cell phone service. I'm gonna say this, we should have done better on that. We're, we're, slow, we're slow out of the gate on it. We should, have, we should have hired a consultant years ago. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not excluding myself from that criticism. There are a lot of issues that cross the desk. And somehow this one, we didn't get to work on it until pretty recently, like November. But I think we're now a little bit more on track. We need some expertise. We, we need some help also in changing our, the law that we have when these uh, applications go in front of the planning board, because the federal, uh, federal law overrules 
local law and is, is and contradicts some of the aspects of our local law there they have what they call shot clocks which are absolute time limits that we have to follow so we are behind in modifying our amending our laws so that we conform to federal rules that's something we've got to do we now have the expertise uh, to help us and we've got to get these coverage maps together and and so we're getting a good start but we're late and you know I can't exclude myself from part of that lateness. Peter? Well, again, you know, it's always good to talk about what we should have done or what we should do, but it takes leadership to actually get it done. Back in August of 2020, I uh, put out an RFP for a wireless communications facility consulting service. We awarded that RFP to Cityscape, as the councilman said, in November of 2020. And, um, you know, we know that there are issues with cell coverage that have been getting worse during the summer season. And with the pandemic, everybody streaming entertainment, working remotely, it completely overwhelmed our infrastructure. Since that time, the town has actually facilitated four new cell towers, two on Stephen Hans Path, one at the old brush dump by the, the Northwest Fire District substation that I worked with the village to create. We also had Verizon, uh, which uh, we granted a temporary tower. They now have a permanent tower that's going to be swapped out at the corner of 27 and Stephen Hans Path to cover those uh, areas in Wainscott uncovered. Uh, AT&T is building new tower on, in, uh, on the Noyak, power, Noyak Wainscott power lines. Um, and we also have, um, you know, an additional tower in Montauk that's being built. Uh, I completed the emergency communications um, you know, multi-year project, over $11 million project that came online this year, uh, just before Memorial Day. Um, but yeah, we definitely need more uh, work on that subject. And we're in the process of doing uh, upgrades to our code to better reflect the FCC regulations. Those codes haven't been updated since 2003. Um, and we're also working to identify with our consultants where the coverage gaps are and uh, it's my opinion that we should, the town should identify sites uh, and that we should help facilitate uh, these, fixing these coverage gaps and requiring that those locations host every carrier. It's been a very hodgepodge kind of a system of free market wherever somebody could get a cell communications tower. There's no sharing of towers really so much. And okay. this is such critical infrastructure. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next I, question. I, uh, I was going to just throw in a comment. It's a late start. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a late start, uh, but you know, looking forward, I'm I'm hopeful we'll uh, get engaged and get the get the work done. It's better late than never. Okay. Okay. Um, the next question. Uh, we'll begin with Peter. Um, what are the advantages of moving the senior center to Abraham's Path, and when will construction begin, and is there a time limit for completion? timeline for completion? Well, there are a number of reasons why moving uh, the senior center is important. First of all, that site on Springs Fireplace just wouldn't accommodate both the construction and the continuation of existing services. It would be too much activity and too small a spot. And we really need to plan for the future when we take undertake a, a large project like Senior Center. We don't want to just build a new Senior Center. We want to build a new Senior Center that reflects our changing demographics. The fact that we have so many more people uh, who are over the age of 55, and we have such a vital um, you know, group of, uh, of aging seniors, and we offer so many different programs for them now. I mean, we, we delivered 67,000 prepared meals to them during the pandemic. Um, which I'm very proud of, but there are so many other services that, that uh, the town can help provide at that location. It's seven acres of land. It's close to other, um, excuse me, it's close to other um, amenities, town-owned properties, recreation facilities. It's on uh, a less traveled road than Springs Fire Place. Springs Fire Place is over 18,000 vehicle trips daily. And uh, having seniors enter that highway is, uh, is treacherous at best. And it's centrally located. It's easy to get to. There'll be plenty of room for parking, and we don't have all those traffic concerns. Thank you. And I, yeah. and I do believe, and if I could just add, I do believe that something that uh, we are moving forward very, very diligently with, I would hope to have an RFP out for a new design and start the planning process 
engaging the public and the planning board with comments on how to develop that. Okay, Jeff? Yeah, I, I'm uh, gl glad to talk about the seniors. I think there's you know, one element we've left out, which is very important to me, and that is actually talking to the senior community. And I mean, you know, the ordinary seniors, not a, not a hand-selected group um, that you know, may be well known to the town board. And I, I say that because last year, uh, when they were uh, trying to uh, squeeze this building that was designed onto the existing site, they realized it wouldn't fit. And, and that's what caused you know, the consternation and the inability to move forward on the project. And um, I, I was at a, a meeting with the seniors, actually with my opponent there, and they were very unhappy that they hadn't been really consulted and talked with and talked to um, about their needs. You know, uh, you know I, I think we all know that all seniors are not exactly the same. They have different wellness needs. There's some seniors that need much more careful attention. Other seniors are very active. And I'm not sure that a one size big building fits all is gonna work. Um, and I, I just think, I wanna say another a word here about the planning process, because I know everybody, you know, including myself, knows that a senior citizen center is long overdue. The planning process is very important. And it's not just to make them take step after step after step and slow it down, it's because it really enables us to do better on our projects. When we have an orderly plan and we send it to the planning board and there's a, there's a, a program where, where people can comment, that public comment is essential. It makes, our, it makes our projects better because we understand what the public wants. So while I wanna see it move quickly, I, would, I think it is very important that we have a deliberative process that goes right to the planning board, that we don't, we don't take control of this. We're, the town board isn't set up to do planning and we need to hear a lot of public comments so that we don't have uh, com criticisms from the senior committee a community saying, you really didn't listen to what we want. So I wanna see a very thorough planning process. Hey, thank you. A rebuttal? Yes, I just want to make a brief comment. It's it's untrue that the town did not reach out to seniors. In fact, there was a very extensive amount of outreach prior to the councilman coming on. He came on at a time when we were just had just awarded an RFP and there had been some planning and development of, of a senior center. Um, so that's just not true. And I, and I do think, of course, it's important to engage all members of the public. Uh, but I will say that Kathy Burke Gonzalez, who's our liaison to the um, Human Services and the Senior Center, has done a truly excellent job in helping to move this effort forward, both with uh, the search for um, a, in an acceptable location and as well as uh, outreach directly to the senior community. Um, there's been ex extensive work already, and I think that this has resulted in what I believe will be a very much highly supported effort in, in this location. Um, okay. Yeah, my, my opponent wants to make it out like I don't know anything about the senior committee, but I guess he forgot the meeting that we attended together and they were not happy seniors. And in fact, a number of them called me at my office and said, can we have you as the liaison? But that wouldn't have happened. And the fact of the matter is that what I said is correct, that the building they designed did not fit on the site. And they didn't know that before they completed the building. And that's why we have to have a new building now on a new site. But again, yeah, you know, the, the important and the other thing is that after they presented that plan in Montauk, uh, the next day, literally the next day, Peter called me up and said, we want a bond for the project. OK, that's the, that's the project that didn't fit on the site. That's why I'm saying I don't want to be a part of a crowd that acts like ready, fire, aim. I want to I want our projects for seniors. They're very important to go through the process that we have that makes them better. It makes projects better better and we understand the public better. I think we can get through hopefully two questions if you keep to the time limit of two minutes. Um, okay, uh, we're going to start with, um, with uh, Jeff on this one. Do you believe that East Hampton Town should um, implement full assessment of real estate taxes values as Southampton has done? And do you believe that this would 
or fairly distribute real estate taxes throughout the town? I think a townwide reassessment, first of all, a townwide reassessment is actually required by law. Um, and ultimately, in the long run, yes, it, it, it I think, more uh, fairly assesses taxes. The, the problem in enacting it, and we talk about this every election cycle, is um, how do you protect uh, people who might be disadvantaged by it, who tend to be uh, seniors, people on fixed incomes, people who are handicapped? And, you know, that is a, a difficult subject. I think, I think there are things that can be done so that you can uh, moderate the impacts because what you don't, everybody, everybody looks at, you know, the grand houses of East Hampton and, sa and says, oh, they've been there for, you know, 42 years and they're still paying taxes that are less than a small home in the Springs. And that's true. But another possibly unintended side effect is that it, when you do do a townwide reassessment, you might wind up hitting those small homeowners in Springs, maybe they're contractors or small business people, senior citizens, handicapped persons, people on fixed in income, social security. So the answer is yes, it's a good idea. Yes, it's required by, by law, but it's very important that we build in safety mechanisms so we don't inadvertently harm people who might otherwise get a pretty big surprise when they get their new reassessed tax bill. Peter? Yeah, I, I think, uh, as Jeff said, this is, uh, this is a topic that comes up every election cycle. And I think he really framed um, uh, that argument and why we need to be careful about moving forward with the town-wide reassessment. Uh, it does seem to impact uh, a number of people. And it's not just the handicapped or elderly, it's anyone particularly local families that have owned their homes for a very long time and managed to stay in the community because they were able to afford a home uh, before real estate prices went through the roof. So I do think there has to be a mechanism for a relief. And, you know, there are a number of, uh, of things that could be done. Generally speaking, when you do a re reassessment, the a third of the population's taxes would go up based on their the value of their properties. A third would go down and a third would basically stay the same. Um, but we're worried about that third that go up. And I think, you know, one of the things that helps with us have a better idea about what the impacts would be is the improved uh, assessment uh, methods that we have um, in terms of keeping up with what the, uh, the values of properties are. And I think from that, uh, an initial study is is warranted in order to further that understanding of who really is affected. Okay, uh, just looking at the at the uh, time here, uh, we'll do one question. Um, towns and villages have until December thirty first to decide if they want to opt out of allowing marijuana sales. What is your position on this? And Peter, if you would start that. Yes, and you know something that you know came about during the pandemic, and honestly, the town board has not focused too much about it. We've talked very little about the implications. However, I have been following other municipalities and their approach, and have attended you know the seminars with the uh, Suffolk Supervisors Association and, and uh, Suffolk, um, the East End Mayors and Supervisors in those discussions about how we approach that. My own personal feeling is that uh, decriminalization of marijuana use is long overdue. Um, it's a victimless, victimless uh, crime. It, I think the penalties never matched um, really uh, what, what happened. And it, in some ways, it's like regulating alcohol. The, the state is making an attempt to do the same thing. Prohibition of alcohol in the 20s led to gang violence uh, and corruption all over. Uh, the same has resulted from the drug war. And, uh, you know, I think there's an opportunity for us to take a look at this. My personal feeling is we probably should opt out because uh, we need to ensure that if um, pot shops are coming to East Hampton, that we have appropriate zoning in place uh, so that they're not located next to school, so that uh, they're maybe in a more appropriate location. Um, and also in order to um, even have a town-wide referendum on the matter, 
we would have to opt out in order to enable that to allow the the town of townspeople of East Hampton to weigh in. And I think okay. we need and we need to have stop you there. Okay, uh, very quick, Jeff. I'm sorry, but we have to go on to closing. But uh, just yeah, I just you know I, I grew up in an era you know of uh, pot smoking and resistance in the Vietnam War. I hate to age myself here, but I'm going to admit that. So I'm very happy about about New York taking these steps. Um, you know, it wasn't so long ago after I heard the announcement that um, I read a story of a man in Texas who was arrested you know, because he had some marijuana on him and and died in prison because of the you know, the methods they use to restrain him or, or what have you. So it's important to know that lives are lost. People have been ruined over what is basically an innocuous drug. I think I would be open to it. I think the uh, to sales, that is. Um, but it's it, it it really comes down to something that's within my expertise. And it's a it's a real zoning and planning issue and problem. I'd want to hear from the public and see what our community thought. I think there are probably ways that you could use zoning and planning to control it. Um, on the other hand, people are worried that it's going to turn, you know, our communities, it's going to okay. accelerate the party town syndrome that we want to avoid. And then there's a counter argument that if we don't do it, other nearby communities get all the tax, uh, the tax benefits of sales uh, from sales that come from us. I, I think we need to hear I do think we need to hear from the public pretty clearly on it. Um, uh, and I, I, you know, I think it could be regulated, but, you know, it depends on what the community wants. I really, it, it, it's a very local issue and I think it's important to hear from them. I'm, I'm going to cut off the rebuttal because we really are running out of time. So we're going to go to the closing statements and um, Peter, you're the one who gets to do your one minute close. Thank you very much. Again, thank opportunity to um, have this debate and address the issues that face Hampton, some of the many. Um, my vision for East Hampton is for a future that's forever vigilant and protecting our natural resources, a future that honors our past and respects our history, traditions, and diversity, and the full uh, future full of opportunity for our residents and for those who live and work here. There's still much to do to protect our beautiful surroundings and the quality of life here in East Hampton. And I want to ensure that future generations will continue to enjoy the beauty and bounty of our surroundings and experience the care and support of our small town community. And I ask for your support to continue this important work. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank you very much uh, for this discussion. I think it's important. Um, you know. I sense in the people I talk to this sort of um, low grade uh, a sense of, of concern about loss. Um, and, and they remember what East Hampton used to be. I'm not, I'm not uh, arguing that uh, we, we can't have change. We need change. We need second homeowners. Uh, we need new businesses. And I've enjoyed many of the changes, but some I haven't. I remember a dog uh, who was a friend of mine who used to sleep on that curve in the street right near the high school on Newtown Lane. And you'd have to stop your car after the season and let him get up and walk to the sidewalk before you could go forward. Um, I think anything that I could do to make East Hampton quieter, calmer, slower, um, is probably a good idea. I think house sizes are really getting out of hand and there's a sense that anything that money can buy should be done. And I, I'd, like to I'd like to focus on the small town values that we all treasure, the quiet and the beauty around us and kind of focus on that and maybe even make our beaches a little bit less commercial uh, so that regular folks can go out with their dogs and hang out on the beach and have a quiet night without uh, feeling that they're crashing a, a fancy dinner party. Um, I just, I, I like, I, East, you know, East Hampton is not just a place I live. It's a part of who I am. That's why okay. I want to protect it. Okay. Well, thank you both, uh, Peter Van Skoyek and Jeff Redman. And uh, wish you luck in the elections coming up. And we're going to just do a quick screen change. Um, and these gentlemen are going to, fade out while the others come on, okay? Thank you. You're very welcome. It is, it is off.
every question. But instead of unlimited rebuttals, which you heard in the prior um, supervisor debate, where there was almost a rebuttal on every question, <laughs> they will only have three chances. And they will raise their hands. I will keep track of, of the rebuttals. Um, and then each candidate will have a one minute closing statement in reverse order of the opening statements. And we are going to start alphabetically. So let me introduce the candidates. They are to my right, Kathy Burke Gonzalez, um, lower left, um, Kate Rogers, and in the center, John Whelan, I'm still joined by our timer, Gloria Ann Burke. Um, and so uh, we'd, launch, and we'd like Miss um, Burke Gonzalez to start her opening statement. Great. Good evening, everyone. And before I start, I'd just like to thank the League of Women Voters for sponsoring tonight's debate. I'm Kathy Burke Gonzalez, and I'm running for re-election to the East Hampton Town Board, having been endorsed by the Democratic and Working Families Parties, and I'm the only incumbent in this race. I live in Springs with my husband, Joe Gonzalez, our 20-year-old daughter, Nina, who will be a senior in college come this fall, and our 23-year-old son, Burke, who recently moved to New York City. When our son started kindergarten, I started attending school board meetings. Not one to sit on the sidelines. I served for nine years on the spring school board. The last two was board president. What I discovered about myself was that I loved public service as the actions I took made a real difference in our students' lives. So eight years ago, I stepped up and I ran for a seat on the town board and was elected in 2013 and again in 2017. Now, there are two basic tenets that I subscribe to as our representative. The first is that my job as a town board member is to enable the community to achieve its goals by getting the facts and building consensus. It is when we encourage public participation to assist in problem solving that we make more informed decisions. The second tenet is that the town's budget is an accounting of our community's priorities, or put another way, a reflection of what we value. Over the last year, we took swift action by establishing COVID testing sites, creating a vaccination clinic, delivering over 67,000 meals to homebound seniors, and supporting our local food pantries. My years of public service have been firmly rooted in my core values, family, hard work, compassion for one another, and respect for our environment. I'm asking for your vote in the Democratic primary on Tuesday, June 22nd, because there's much more work to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kate, you're up next. Yes, thank you so much, Judy. Uh, as, as well, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for the opportunity that they're providing in this debate uh, for the voters and for the candidates to um, get their positions out. Um, and with that, I'll start. I'm Kate Rogers, and I'm running for town board in the Democratic primary on June 22nd. I've lived full-time in East Hampton for 20 years. I've raised my son here. And as a working mother and businesswoman, I have always made time for the things that matter to me. And service to my town and my community always has been and is a high priority. I will bring the experienced leadership needed to bring our community together in pursuit of solutions to the issues we face. As a member of the town board, I will build on the many democratic successes while continuing to recognize and respond to the evolving needs of our community. I've served as vice chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals and a member for a total of nine years. I've been a member of the town's Nature Preserve Committee, Energy Sustainability Committee, and sit on the Springs Senior, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Springs Citizens Advisory Committee. In 2017, after witnessing the devastation wrought by Hurricane Sandy on families and friends up west, I applied and was trained by former Vice President Al Gore for the Climate Reality Project and began my advocacy for solutions to the climate crisis as a climate leader. I now serve as a training mentor, a chapter chair, and a chair of the New York State Coalition of Chapters. I'm also a member of Win With Wind and WinWorks Long Island. As a lifelong Democrat, I stepped up when our party needed me and have been serving for the last three years as chair of the East Hampton Democratic Committee. I strongly believe that success in public office comes from facilitating an informed community building coalitions, listening to diverse opinions and finding consensus and then acting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John? 
Thank you, and good evening, everyone, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this debate and for everything you continue to do. Um, I am John Whelan, and I am running um, for as a Democrat and endorsed by the Independence Party as well um, for town board. Um, I'd like to start by saying I'm, I'm really not running against anyone in this campaign. I'm really running for the town of East Hampton for, and for the trust of the voters so that I may have a chance to use my my lifelong experience here to serve to serve the town. I've um, I was born and raised here in East Hampton and grew up on a farm out in Northwest with my parents, Mary and Dwayne Whelan. Many of you may remember them. My dad served the town for many decades uh, as town board, as planning board, zoning board attorney and um, authored the zoning code way back when I was born for the then town board. My mother was a great artist and a school teacher. Um, after her large family, her 12 children were off and off to school and off to kindergarten with the youngest. Um, I went away to college in Minnesota and, um, and, and a year in France. And then I uh, went to graduate school, the College of Architecture and Urban Studies and got a master's degree in, in, um, in architecture. The last 30 years since then, I have um, served this town in many capacities. Um, um, doing a lot of volunteer work, which I, I very much appreciate. I, um, I went on to serve as um, commissioner for the town of East Hampton on the Suffolk County Planning Commission for two years. And then Larry Cantwell asked me to step down. And I've been, I've been running, I mean, I, pardon me, running, I've been chairing with pleasure the Zoning Board of Appeals for the last seven years. Um, um, I look forward to the chance to serve, to speak some more tonight also, but also just to serve the town and use my background in planning and my team spirit, my teamwork spirit. I'm a collaborator. I enjoy people. Anyone who knows me knows that. I like people. I like to listen. I, um, I enjoy um, hearing opinions. And I, at the same time, I know how to make hard decisions um, when it comes time as a board and as a leader. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, on this question, we'll start with, um, with, with Kathy. Um, affordable workforce housing. What is in the pipeline and how can you work to increase the housing that is available for our town employees? So currently the town and, and other affiliated housing groups uh, manage close to 600 uh, housing units, be them single family uh, apartments, the new condominiums that we did on Acrobonic, or senior only apartments. Uh, back in 2018, we put $2 million in the budget and we used those funds to purchase the Phillips property, which is uh, 395 Panico Road, which we had a, a hearing on today to put an affordable housing overlay over that property, seven acres to develop affordable housing there. And we've also purchased two properties on Route 114, where we're, we're, which we will develop as well. We've been working with the East Hampton Housing Authority. They've got the units open now. Uh, I believe it's 37 units uh, in Amagansett, uh, over there at Gansett Meadows. And they're now working on a project for 50 apartment uh, rental units on Three Mile Harbor Road. Um, you know, we are in an affordable housing crisis. Uh, the good news is that we've got uh, Fred Thiel, you know, working with us and, you know, helping all of the towns here on the East End. He's put together uh, legislation to have a community housing fund. It's uh, something that has already passed the assembly. It would be uh, a half of percent would uh, be charged on the transfer of property. We think that that would operate like the CPF, which is a 2% transfer. And we believe that could generate anywhere from four to $6 million each year. And that money could be used for down payment assistance, uh, land acquisition and development of affordable housing projects, housing counseling, and uh, you know, again, project development. So there's, uh, that would be a funding mechanism. It would operate similarly to the way we had to structure CPF and the water quality where we'd have to have a townwide referendum and pass local legislation, but there's a lot, you know, in the pipeline right now. Okay, Kate? Yes, I believe with, uh, I agree with uh, Kathy, and I, I believe that uh, housing affordability, uh, we are in a crisis, so therefore I believe we should do everything we can do. The bill that Kathy speaks of is Assembly Bill 2633, 
that has just passed the assembly. This, this bill will make a significant difference if it passes the House and gets signed by the governor. I ask everyone to make a quick phone call uh, in that effort. Um, and this will help us, this one half uh, percent will really uh, help uh, the town um, achieve a, a more affordable housing for our community members. Um, as everyone knows, the pandemic has added an extra burden to housing affordability in East Hampton, and, and we need to do all that we can. Right now, I, I'm happy that the town has made efforts to a, allow affordable house uh, apartments and houses in residential, residential houses and in detached structures. I'd like to take another look at that. I, I don't know if there's a lot of applications that have come in. Uh, I'd like to take another look at that to see where the stumbling blocks are and how we can aid that as well. I think that also helps some of our seniors stay in their homes. Um, and um, I support any and every effort, um, private, public partnerships that we can do to, to increase our, our affordable housing stock. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Well, um, I, I, I don't want to be considered a, a one-issue one candidate, but um, affordable housing is certainly one at the top of my list. I, I think if there was one word, it would be the environment and the character of this wonderful town we have and keeping it um, as, 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 as wonderful as it is and um, with regard to our fragile ecosystems. Having said that, we still need, we do need affordable housing. Growing up out here, I have many of my high school friends who went away to college and got their degrees and could have brought their, their, their talent back through our town, but could not afford to live here. So we, we all know the brain drain. Um, I feel that this issue of affordable housing makes me um, uh, uniquely qualified to be in addition to the board. I'm a team player. I think I could bring a whole new skill set to this board with my degrees that I have. I started building houses when I was a teenager and did carpentry through college and graduate school. And I know the trades. I appreciate the trades. I think I can work, um, we can, we can work, um, I could work um, well with, um, I know I can work well with the local architects. I would like to see smaller um, sustainable green houses um, considered for the affordable houses. Um, I would like to see some, I know there would be some volunteer landscape architects and architects that would work on getting some, some very good green designs for um, these affordable housing units. I come from years of planning. I spent five years involved in the raw school construction. Our office has done pro bono work and on built affordable housing in Southampton, designed a large complex in West Hampton that wasn't built. I continue to do volunteer work with the retreat and their facilities. So I would be so excited to be on the board, be on the board and to really dig in, in, into this. And, um, and I think my, my skills and management can really be an asset to the town board on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next question will start with Kate. Um, what water quality improvement projects do you support to protect the town's drinking water and other water supplies? And how have you or would you use the CPF funds that were allocated for this purpose? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I support uh, the wastewater management um, programs that the town is, uh, as, is progressing on, uh, particularly downtown Montauk. Um, and uh, the new number of uh, projects that were just approved using the new CPF designation, like at the Springs General Store and the Montauk condominiums, uh, septic upgrades, um, and the planting of the uh, uh, new kelp and seaweed uh, to help clean the water, I think is a very valuable program um, that has just gotten started. Uh, it's out in Montauk. They did the first uh, starting. I support um, also educating the public about the issues, which is uh, the runoff of nitrogen uh, from our storm runoff and the use of uh, fertilizers that run off into our, our ponds and water bodies. So um, I am very pleased to see the um, application of the CPF to water quality issues. I think it's a natural fit. Uh, sustaining our community means sustaining the people in it and our environment. 
So they're not separate issues. They're all the same issue. And uh, we should always keep focused on the sustainability of East Hampton. I also, um, and I think John will remember this, had tears in my eyes when the new nitrogen systems were approved by the county. I hope that uh, uh, Congressman Swosey's and Gillibrand's uh, 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 legislation to protect us from tax liability for um, these uh, grants that are available, both on the county level and the town level, passes in the legislature, and we can see a forwarding of that program as well. Kathy? I think John's next, but I'm happy to go. It's okay. Um, okay, sure. Um, so, um, I, absolutely, I've been supportive of all of the projects that have come before the board. Um, you know, we water quality, we can use up to 20% of the CPF money. I believe in 2021, we have 2.1, I'm sorry, $4.7 million to spend for water quality improvement projects. Um, we are, you know, done a lot of outreach for the low nitrogen systems that Kate mentioned. And right now before the board, we've had a public hearing on expanding the water protection district. Uh, prior, we had uh, it was a two. Uh, we used the Harbor Overlay District to define uh, who would get you know higher grant incentives, and now we are going to be using ten-year travel time, which encompasses all of Springs, uh, which is tremendous, and other parts of the town. We can you'll get up to twenty thousand dollars in grant money. The county had run out of. Uh, grant money at the end of last year. They've replenished that and the state has money available as well. So if you, you know, uh, change up your septic system and go with a low nitrogen system, you could get up to $40,000 in incentives. Um, and I just want to say that we had, you know, we had to work through as a town board, the local legislation, we had to put together the water quality technical advisory committee. We've, uh, we've, you know, fine tuned it as we've gone along. And uh, it's a tremendous process. We, you know, have uh, grant opportunities where we put out requests and it's a very deliberative process as the committee goes through and reviews applications. And, uh, and it's a, a very robust project. And I, it's really, you know, making a difference, you know, with changing out these septic, our septic systems and going with the low nitrogen systems. Okay, John. Thank you. Um, yes, this is this is a crucial issue, and um, for for our town, for our county, for our country, or state, it's. Um, um, I I would. This is another another aspect of the work of the town board that I would be. I am very eager eager to be a part of. Um, I've been thinking about this and working with this um, for for years. Much of the work I did on the applications on the Suffolk County Planning Commission had to do with groundwater issues and fragile ecosystems in the county. And then the last seven years on the zoning board, 90, 80% of those um, applications and issues have to do with our groundwater. Uh, some of them have to do with character and neighborhood and variances, and that's, that's the other 20%, right? But, but all of the focus of that work on the zoning board, and I have to say, I have an incredible um, zoning board. Um, it was a pleasure working with Kate. I have an incredible zoning board, um, and it, it, it's, I'm just so proud of the focus that we as a team, again, the teamwork, put into our, our job and we do it with passion and I would continue that passion. I think my background, again, I want the trust of the voters because my background in this with regard to, um, to the planning and with regard to the, um, the civil engineering that goes into, into drainage, um, that the issues of buffers and, and green environmental swales and, and rain gardens, um, and obviously the new IA systems are so incredibly valuable. And I think now that we're, thank God we're getting over this pandemic, maybe um, the, the next town board, we could all work um, and make, make, make that a big as, as an education issue. I'm really getting townspeople up to date, try and make it interesting so that they would come out to meetings and learn about the mm -hmm. IA systems, learn about the rebates, um, and learn about what they can do for their for their for their house for the neighborhood and for the town of East Hampton. It it all of it goes back to the edge waters, the bays as we know, and the coastal shores and the bluffs and the and 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 the wetlands. And a lot of it goes back just to the water systems and promoting um, promoting. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I I went over promoting. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> First one that's done that. 
Um, okay, John, the next question is for you. Okay. Um, what do you think is the state of local businesses as a result of COVID? Are there things that the town can do to help small businesses? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, it's a tough issue. Um, it sure is interesting, isn't it, how, how um, like this meeting here tonight on Zoom, um, it's just amazing how the whole world has changed. And I found um, our zoning board has been working on Zoom, um, you know, for what, a year ago since last March or something. And as well, the office, um, it's Stella Montrahani Architects. I've been here for about 20 of my 30 years since graduate school. We work with that. And, um, and it's changed, and it's changed the businesses, and it's changed the job opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, I really would like to, like to see promoting jobs with, um, with, 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 with sustainable design and affordable housing. I would love to see promoting the trades um, and giving them a chance to be a part of these, um, the construction of some of these projects. And as well, I've always um, thought about uh, all of this kind of ties in as well to transportation jobs and, and how the workers get here. Obviously, if they can't live here, they have to commute. And um, we have so many commuters and I would like it, I would like to see more young people um, getting involved in our local trades. I'm sorry, was that a stop there? Did I say, okay, sorry. Um, one minute. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, I, I really like the idea of the town board and the town getting involved. I do volunteer work with the high school over the years and getting involved with our high school students. And some people, you know, are not going to go away to college. And that's great. They can stay here and we can get them an affordable house and they can become the plumbers and the carpenters and the electricians and the technical IT people. And and I just think there's a real chance and an exciting chance in the future. And so much of it is based on affordable housing and getting green jobs that go with, um, I'm a huge proponent of solar energy. And uh, there are a lot of green jobs that are available when that comes along. Thank you. Okay, um, Kate? Yes, hi. Um, I am very excited about uh, this type of question. Um, I know that during the pandemic, um, you know, we, we kept it local and we, uh, uh, brought in as much as we could and, and supported the local takeout restaurants. Not so great for uh, the weight, but certainly helpful to sustain the community. But one of the things that I think we can do besides uh, supporting local businesses physically is to upgrade our infrastructure, both broadband and, and all of our communication abilities, to take advantage of this new way of working from home where people don't necessarily have to work in exactly East Hampton, but they can earn a living by working here. But to know it, able to do that, we need to upgrade our broadband infrastructure and do everything we can to make telecommunications much better. So that, that's one idea I'm really excited about working on is, is finding ways to support local economies, even if they're working remotely. Thank you. Judy Freeze. I think Judy? so. Can you hear us? I think we've lost Judy. Yeah, there she is. Uh, she froze. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about. I, I don't know if we lost Kathy. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, the question, just to go over again, was about what can the, uh, what might the town do to help small businesses recovering from COVID. Sure. So, so during the pandemic, you know, we worked very closely with our local businesses. We immediately, you know, put together the business recovery committee. And uh, one of the things we did was help facilitate outdoor dining once the restaurants were, were free to open back in June of 2020. Uh, personally, I'm on the uh, special event and film permitting committee. And we worked with our local caterers because there were some issues when the governor's uh, put out his executive orders where uh, off-site licensed caterers weren't able to, to operate on residential properties. We lobbied New York State and we finally got that freed up. And uh, even over the years, you know, we've helped facilitate and create, uh, you know, short forms for permit applications so that they could be, you know, uh, could work through the process swiftly. Uh, we also, you know, I work with the film production companies that come out here just 
HBO was out in April. They shot for five days midweek. They uh, rented 100 hotel rooms a night. I mean, that's a huge boom to our hospitality industry during, during the off season and particularly after the year that we've had. Um, I've also, I meet with folks that are looking to start businesses and who don't really understand, you know, our zoning and, and how it all works. And I facilitate uh, meetings with them and myself and members of our planning department so that they can better understand if they're looking to open a business here, what is, what's required. So, um, you know, we also, you know, during the pandemic and, and the supervisor mentioned it earlier, we brought in a communications firm because it was very important that we communicated to, you know, our <clears throat> second homeowners, our year round population, our visitors, our local businesses, you know, how, and how to keep them protected and safe. Thank you again for stopping. I think we have time for two more questions. Um, and one will start with, um, with Kathy. Um, what is your vision for putting East Hampton on a path for being a more sustainable community? Uh, so, you know, I have to actually thank Kate for this. So, you know, Kate has been involved with the Climate Reality Project for many years and is a mentor and trained under Al Gore. And, you know, as you know, we started getting into on the board, we're talking about wastewater districts in downtown Montauk. And, and we've got the CARP study going where we're talking about coastal erosion and sea level rise. I realized if I wanted to lead in the community on, on sustainability and resiliency, I needed to educate myself. So I went down to Atlanta uh, back in March, I believe it was of 2019, and trained under uh, Vice President Al Gore. And, and what it you know, I realized is that, you know, the, the climate crisis that we're in and how it is affecting us, you know, on a local, uh, on such a local basis, like, for instance, after Superstorm Sandy, we had to raise Gerard Drive, you know, we've had our uh, forests, you know, devastated, and, and, and habitats, you know, um, destroyed because of the southern pine beetle here in New York. And we had, you know, issues in Amagansett, you know, because of the farm fields there. They, they couldn't get the potatoes out of the ground because we had so much rain. And then when they finally, the seeds went down, you know, it was so dry and the birds came in and there was dust storms in Amagansett. I mean, there are, uh, climate change and this climate crisis is affecting us on so many levels and we need to be poised and, and it's a heavy lift. Fortunately, you know, we've got, you know, citizen or committees that are, uh, you know, helping the board and doing outreach with the board and advising us. We've got a strong natural resources department that are very educated and are bringing constantly, actually, to every work session, ways that we can build resiliency and move forward. Thank you. Um, John? Thank you. Um, Yes, again, this issue, I think it, it pretty much ties into so many facets of, of what, what we do as a town. And as far as our future, I think it all has to be tied into some of the big picture items, such as um, protecting our open space, uh, protecting our, our groundwater, protecting our, 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 our wetlands and, and, our, and our beaches. And the way we can get there is continuing to do what we are doing as a town and, and not allowing overdevelopment. Um, continue to working with the innovative alternative of the sanitary systems and continue to educate people as to the fragility of the environment. I'm a strong uh, a proponent of solar energy and wind, wind energy. And I think the town board, the town of East Hampton um, and the town building should take the lead in doing um, lead certified type buildings where green buildings, whereby there is a net zero um, carbon um, footprint there. We, we, we have the ability to do that with, um, with the solar panels, with, the, um, with heat pumps and with geo, geothermal technology. And I think if we start as a town and lead, lead the way others will follow, and obviously we can work with all of our wonderful CACs and all of our committees and getting them involved to get people up to speed on what's available out there and continue to push for rebates um, whenever possible. 
um, to allow this this upgrade to happen. Uh, we do need we do need to upgrade our infrastructure, and in doing that, we can incorporate green design and and technologies and um, and really work towards the future. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Yes, uh, this is, uh, well, obviously uh, something that's very near and dear to my heart is responding to the climate crisis as a coastal community. Uh, I've grown up on coastal communities uh, before I lived here. I lived in another Long Island coastal community, which was very which was severely devastated by Hurricane Sandy. Um, it, it, if you look at the statistics, I can give you the science. I can tell you the worldwide consensus on the climate emergency that we're in, but the the people's stories of losing their homes, of the time it took to uh, gain grants back, to get paid from insurance. There's still people that have not recovered from that storm. And I don't want that for my community. I want us to be very aware of the impacts of sea level rise and how the estimates on the timeframes are changing rapidly due to a feedback loop. Um, the models are, are constantly being updated and I know that we can make our town resilient by, by protecting our, our structures and our uh, environment from the impacts of climate change. As Kathy said, we're already feeling the impacts, but one thing about making a, a community sustainable, it's just not only about climate change. Again, this is working in separate silos for each issue. I think uh, the sustainability for our community, for climate, for climate, is also sustaining our community, uh, being able to have housing affordability, being able to protect the assets that we have, and so uh, I think that we're way far ahead in our planning for the future. But I think we need to continue and constantly revisit and see what we can do better. The most important thing we can do is the transition to renewable energy and stop using fossil fuels as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay. Um, the final question, um, we'll start with, with Kate. Um, what would be your top priority if you are elected? So I've kind of said that in a roundabout yeah. way already, um, but uh, to put it into practical terms and not theoretical, sustaining this, this town, the character of this town, the history of this town, for the future is my top priority. Um, and in, in that, I would like to work on the uh, cell service. Uh, if, if I'm gonna look at things in particular, um, I would like to uh, collaborate with the, my fellow board members on working on these issues, such as cell service, broadband infrastructure, and of course, doing everything that we can to protect the town from climate change. Uh, those would be uh, a sustainable East Hampton comes up, though, all of those things for me come under the same heading uh, to keep us sustainable for the future. Thank you. Kathy? So I guess it would have to be protecting our natural environment, delivering water quality improvement projects, including the low nitrogen septic systems and site specific uh, stormwater remediation, habitat restoration, wastewater treatment projects would be preserving open space, wetlands, watersheds, and farmland with CPF monies, uh, identifying vulnerable properties and developing the coastal resiliency strategies that we need to adapt, uh, coordinating with the Army Corps and the DEC to bring FIMP, our beach nourishment project to downtown Montauk, uh, advancing offshore wind and solar energy you know, we've got the Akabonic Solar Farm, we've got a Green Homes Initiative. Uh, we talked uh, in, earlier in the supervisor's uh, debate about the, the South Fork Wind Project and the adoption of the CCA authorizing legislation. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big lift, it's a heavy lift, um, but, you know, it's what, you know, it's why we all live here, right? It's to, you know, we, and we need to protect, you know, our natural environment. John? Thank you. Uh, there's a nice quote you may know from Maya Angelou, where she writes, if you don't know where you've come from, you don't know where you're going. And um, that's one thing I do know is where East Hampton, where I come from in this town, and, and how spectacular it was when I was a child growing up, and how spectacular it still is, thank God, to good planning and good zoning. So my main commitment, besides repeating what, um, you know, what Kate and Kathy have just said, 
um, really would be would be the character of East Hampton, and that when I, I mean character, I mean both the environmental character and the um, the character of our towns and our villages and our our neighborhood neighborhoods. And we are developing. Uh, we have to curtail that, and yet we have to um, we have to work with the proper zoning in place um, to do that. I think with the infrastructure and rebuilding our water systems and 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 running Suffolk County water. Um, um, and run and bicycle paths and open space and parkland and affordable housing and sustainable design and maybe smaller um, smaller greenhouses. Um, I think I, I think all of that combined um, and the continued work of the zoning board, things like the planning, the zoning board, the planning department, the natural resources department, etc. We're very fortunate to have these in place. I actually spent a year as a planner um, um, way back when, and I have great respect um, for 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 what we have going in the town. And I find it incredible. I've been sitting in on all of these meetings on the the, the CACs and our our town committees. And um, I find it incredible the passion that people growing up here, it's always been this way, but the passion that people have for this town. And I think a key to that in the future will be continued, as I said, to educate the public, to educate. I don't mean educate, I mean inform the public and inform our summer, our, 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 our part-time residents on all of these key issues and how they can get involved. And I, I like the expression, you know, it's better to be part of the solution than part of the problem. And that's what I want to bring to the town board, um, working hard to, to, to deal with these issues. Thank you. I'll stop. Thank you. Okay. Well, why don't you continue with your one minute closing statement? Okay. Thank you. First of all, thanks again for all of, uh, for this nice discussion. Um, and it's nice to see everyone. Um, sometimes we haven't seen each other in so long. It's crazy. Um, I'm, I, I'm looking for um, the support of the voters of East Hampton town you know i know i know so many people when i was with my raised uh, with 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 um with my former wife colleen mcgowan who taught it 30 years at spring school and we're very close and she was a wonderful art teacher and my three daughters went to school there and when we would walk through town on like memorial day they would say daddy you have to run for mayor because you you know everyone and i do know a lot of people and and yet i appreciate all of our new residents so much and the value that they bring to this town I'm looking for the trust of the voters so that I can get in and work hard. I would be leaving my position and taking a severe pay cut if elected to the town board, but I'm passionate about doing this. It's something I've wanted to do, and I really look forward to the chance um, to being able to serve my town again in another capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Kate? Yes, thank you. First, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for the again for the for this opportunity for this debate and frankly for all that you do for voting rights and voting information for our community. Um, the one thing about me is that I dig in deep and I'm a really hard worker and uh, have sometimes been described as like being a dog with a bone um, by uh, colleagues because I the research and and the passion for helping our community is is very runs that commitment runs very deep in me. I, uh, I will uh, state again, I strongly believe that success in public office comes from facilitating an informed community, building coalitions, listening to diverse opinions, finding consensus, and then taking action. And with your vote, I will bring the same drive, passion, and positive energy that I brought to the community as a volunteer, grassroots organizer, Democratic committee chair, ZBA member, and vice chair, because this is what public service means to me. So please, I ask for your support and vote in the Democratic primary on June 22nd. Thank you. Yeah. Kathy? Thank you. Again, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for giving us an opportunity tonight to address the issues, the pressing issues of our community. And like all of you, I want to see East Hampton remain a beautiful, healthy, and extraordinary place to live, work, and raise a family, a place where all of us share in the responsibility of caring for our community. Caring for our community means protecting drinking water, surface waters, and harbors and bays as clean, pure water is vital. Advancing offshore wind and solar energy rather than dirty, polluting fossil fuels. Saving our beaches and beach access, leading a thoughtful process to secure meaningful relief from noisy aircraft operations. Creating affordable housing opportunities, supporting quality childcare and after school care for our kids, increasing mental health services for our adolescents and health and wellness programs 
for our seniors. I'm asking for your vote in the Democratic primary so I can continue to address the pressing needs of our children, our seniors, and our nat natural environment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank um, all of you on behalf of the League of Women Voters um, and for your participation this evening. Uh, we'd like to thank LTV and Jody Gambino for their help in organizing this and in running, running this so smoothly for us. And I wish all of the candidates good luck in the election coming up. Um, and for our viewers, please go out and vote. And for your friends and neighbors who didn't have a chance to watch this debate, um, it is available on YouTube, um, on LTV's channel on YouTube, and it will probably be replaying on LTV channel 20. So there's ample time to watch it. Um, remember that early voting starts on June 12th and the date of the primary itself is June 22nd. And thank you from to Barbara McClancy and Gloria Ann Burke and Alexis and everyone in the lead and have a pleasant weekend. Okay. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Good night. Thank you so Bye. much. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.